Talk Shoes. Recorded live. Good evening, everybody. This is Jörg Lissmann again from YouTube channel Joggler66 with another, with another episode of Hour of the Truth. We are today the 21st of May 2015, so in the middle of spring and the summer is almost at the doors. I love the weather outside. It's sunny and it's quite uh, comfortable with about 15, 16 degrees outside. That's all we can expect here in Belgium at this time of year. I think Walt will give us a, uh, a little um, uh, status of his weather there over in Oregon when I introduce him in a few moments. But before I, before I do that, I first want to tell you what we're dealing with tonight. We are continuing the reading of the booklet that Walt put together from different um, booklets and books in itself. The, uh, the Vatican Jazz Conspiracy and I advise you to not to not miss that. I advise you also, when you're a little bit older and you have children in your house, to share this broadcast with the children in your house because these children are our future. And if anybody can set this world right now, it is we, when we, in, when we educate our children, we do exactly that to the children, what the Antichrist doesn't want us to do with, with them. So before we go any, uh, into any reading tonight, I want to start with two quotes. And one quote that really has grown to my heart lately it comes from the book Rulers of Evil by F. And is very imperative in considering talking what I just told you about the children and that we have to educate our children. Get them away from the Game Boy and PlayStation and television and all that stuff. Put a good book in their hand. Trust them. They are smarter than you think and they are more interested in these things than you think when they are young. Get them when they are young. That is what the Antichrist wants with their education system. This is what we have to do. So Martin Luther said in an appeal to the ruling classes in 1520, think about that, that's 495 years ago, he said exactly these words. Though our children live in the midst of a Christian world, they faint and perish in misery because they lack the gospel in which we should be training and exercising them all the time. I advise no one to place his child where the scriptures do not reign paramount. Schools will become wide open gates of hell if they do not diligently engrave the holy scriptures on young hearts. Every institution where men are not increasingly occupied with the word of God must become corrupt. End quote. And this means every institution. This means kindergarten, this means school, this means university, but that also means your working environment. And take that to the heart in the best interest of your children. And please don't call them kids because that's something that goats get. Uh, animals get kids. We people get children, not kids. So uh, I made you a little bit attend of the of the motto of uh, the Jesuits and everything, that they want to keep us from our education. I want to just remind you of the motto of the show of Hour of the Truth. And that is also something that, of course, will be reflected in our reading today in the uh, Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy. The motto of the show of Hour of the Truth is just very, very simple. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today, they call us terrorists and send out their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, but the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible-believing people who uphold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. And by repeating this motto, I will now turn it over to my very good friend and brother in Christ over there in Oregon on the west coast of the United States from www.granddesignexposed.com, Walt Stickel. Hello, Walt. Welcome to the show, and how are you? Hello, York. From the shores of southern Oregon, here in the country of Romerica, it's a pleasure to be on the, the uh, co-host with York Blitzman from Belgium, the de facto capital of the European Union. You know, I had something very interesting happen to me this last week in a phone call. And I've thought about it for three or four days, and I, I'm going to speak slowly, and I want to be able to really explain the point 
of this broadcast, the goal of this broadcast, and the focus. Now, the focus of this broadcast is the Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy. This is the booklet that I put together with historical facts. <clears throat> now, in this little booklet, if you do a, a, a search word on the word Jesuits, the word Jesuits is in the book 221 times. So, because the, why do I bring that up? Because there are many, many books written about the conspiracy that the word Jesuit is not even in the book. Now, I'm going to give you a, a very good textbook example. There's a book out called The Kingdom of the Cults. The Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin. Now, this has got, it's got every cult in the world in this, in this book. It's about a five 600-page book, very thick book. And guess what cult is not in the book? The word That's Jesuit. An easy one. It's an easy one, but the, for the people in the in the world, it's still it's amazing how this gets left out. The biggest cult in the world was left out of this book. Now, who do you think what was behind this book? What is the motive? is to take you and steer you away from the word Jesuit and the Roman Catholic Church. Now, this is a perfect example. The phone rings, and some Christian friends of mine, I'm going to call them Christian friends, because they are brothers, and they asked, was I asked how I was doing, I was doing fine, can't complain, they had been going to a Seventh-day Adventist church for the last eight months. No, excuse me, eight, week, eight, eight weeks. And uh, I, as they, I listen, and you know, and I, I understand I've studied the Seventh-day Adventist and different things, but you know, I, I'm with my freedom of conscience, with the freedom of conscience that God give us, it's a learning experience. And I'm, I was sure that they'd come to the point where they'd understand some of the things that they were learning. And sure enough, she went on for a, over 15 minutes. And I'm not exaggerating. It could have been longer. And she was, in, they, were, they were pointing out that uh, uh, Ellen G. White got stuck on Ellen G. White and how Ellen G. White is not a prophet, and I, I, I'm not agree. I'm, she, I'm, I'm listening, and she went. They, they went on and on and on. After she finished, I said, uh, "Do you realize that in that the dragon is coming to speak on September 23rd, 2015, to a joint session at Congress?" And the reply was, don't go there. Don't go there. Think about, it took me a couple days to realize what's happening here. The motive, again, for the book is to put the word Jesuit in our vocabulary, a working vocabulary so when we look out into history and when we see the visit of a Jesuit pope on September 23rd, we have an idea as God's children what we're seeing happen in our lifetime. We're seeing a counter-reformation pope, a Jesuit pope, coming to a country that was started in 1776. And in 1776, the Roman Catholic Church was not considered Christian. They were superstitious and idolatrous. 
99% of the people knew what Rome was all about. So we're living in 2015 now. When you bring up the word Jesuit and the Jesuit Pope is coming to speak and you say, don't go there, don't go there. Now, the reason I brought up the Walter Martin, the Walter Martin book, is see, they're willing, the world is willing to talk about all of these cults. But isn't it amazing that the Roman Catholic Church is left out of it? The same party. How did I find out? How did I find out that Rome was part of the equation? Well, I was listening to, to Greg Samaski's broadcast, broadcast in, investigative journal, and I had heard a little bit about John Daniel, and I heard heard up they were talking about the Jesuits. You see, but but but. After you, so what got me started was a book given to me by the same people. They were just sharing a book written by Steve Walbert. Oh, he's a Seventh-day Adventist. Okay, everybody run for cover, run for cover. At 3.30 in the morning, the book was by Steve Walbert and it was called Left Behind. He's got a chapter in there on the Antichrist. And he used scripture after scripture after scripture and took you through this small little chapter. And by the time I got to the end of this little chapter, a light bulb went on. I've been out for studying and researching, and I've got every book there is written on the Freemasons and all the the Mormons and all the you know I, I studied the Freemasons, the Mormons, all of it. Okay. So so where am I going with this? Why does this focus on the broadcast that we're doing today? See, we're talking about something that's out of the vocabulary. And when I mention this, because, of, in other words, after a little, little bit known to them, they're the ones that, tr- that they handed me a book. Now, am I a Seventh-day Adventist? No. But I'm going to tell you something. There's more truth, there's more truth in the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine than the Mormons. Anybody with two neurons running can tell you that. And, of course, they can't talk about the Antichrist today, the Seventh-day Adventists, because they've been overcome by the Jesuits. It's a known fact. Now, the point is, if, is it here? Isn't this interesting? That my brother and sister in Christ are will allow... They want to expose the false religions out here. But when it comes to Rome, and by the way, I've given them some key books. Matter of fact, they've got the book, Rulers of Evil, which York York is reading now, and he's on the fourth chapter, and you'll be able to read along with this book and download this book. This is a very important read because of the year we live in. Tupper Saucy had no idea when he wrote that book that in 2015 that a Jesuit will be coming to speak to a joint session of Congress to, to push his, his encyclical on climate change. So the more I thought about this, this last week, the more I realized 
what is going on? The Bible tells us that the people will be under a strong delusion. What? Real quick, uh, York, uh, give that quote that Bill Clinton said about our adversary. How did he say uh, that? The the um, the biggest mistake uh, one can do is to underestimate their adversary. Now let me that ask. Is not, that is not word for word. So therefore, I have to look it up. But that's yeah, just I think that's I think that's that's it, 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 it's word for word. I think you, you quoted it good. But see, um, it, the worst thing you can do in life is to underestimate your adversary. Yeah, the worst thing. Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton said that openly on CBS News on March thirty first, nineteen ninety nine. And again, going back to our broadcast, our broadcast is the Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy. That is our adversary. It's not the Seventh-day Adventist. It's not the Mormons. Of course, the Mormons are pretty close to the top, and they were started by the Jesuits also. But our adversary is Rome. And the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. You're absolutely right, Walt. You know, God left in the Bible no doubt for anybody to know and identify who Jesus Christ was. And we would be absolute idiots if we only thought for half a minute that God would be not clear about stating in the Bible 100% surely to identify who the biblical, prophetic, and historical Antichrist is. The problem is just that the people don't read that anymore. And that, why don't they read it anymore? Because there's always some great teacher who tells them what it is like. And this teacher is whether a priest or a pastor in their community, in their church, or there's someone in their education system that they go through from school via university to whatever, or there's uh, some guy of a work colleague, or there's some famous, um, fabulous guy or woman on the television, which is the new satanic altar, according to Anton LaVey, founder of the, the Church of Satan, they don't study the things for themselves anymore. People have become ignorant because they think that everything that is taught to them in the system, in the mainstream system, whether it is news, it is magazines, it is television, it is radio, um, it is movies, take whatever outlet you want because the people think that everything that is taught in the mainstream from education through entertainment to politics everywhere is the truth. And they just swallow it. They don't ask anymore. If they would ask more questions, they would be transferred to a state where they are more interested in reading a book that is not about some novel but that is about facts, for example, historical facts, because that is what the Jesuits really did a very, very good job on, and that is just taking the culture and take, uh, taking the culture of the peoples away. The peoples, I mean peoples, yes, I mean all the peoples, not only the Americans, but we are here in Europe are suffering exactly the same thing. And ask any Vietnamese or Korean or Russian how much do they know about their real history or how much they know about that that is, imp uh, that is um, uh, imposed on them from the education system that they had gone through. It's uh, everywhere the same. And the Roman Catholic Church feeds on ignorance. It is what satisfies her that the people they rule are ignorant are, and are not asking any questions. And that is why they are so successful. And they take, when they, when they, when they uh, rewrite history in their sense and, you know, change books. I mean, when I'm reading through Rulers of Evil and other books, there are always sources mentioned. And these sources are sometimes books from 1902, 1888, 1795, I don't know, whatever, whatever year. Or it's that edition of an encyclopedia or that edition of an encyclopedia. You have to see to get older um, editions of encyclopedias and sources that you are having. Not because old is almost always better, no, but because in the older versions you have mentioned of things that are not even mentioned in newer versions anymore. And Tapasosi made in this book um, a few very nice uh, remarks on that. I think it was 
um, on the Catholic Encyclopedia from 1902, and then that was changed in 1967. Yeah, right after Vatican II, it was changed and something was taken out. That is very profound. That is information that you don't find anymore. So when you don't have the right information, you have a wrong view on history. And when you have a wrong view on history, you don't have any culture behind you. And that, will, that means that everything that the government just wants will be implanted into your brain as your culture. And that is why today you have, and now I take the example of America, people ranting after television shows like American Idol or going to the Super Bowl and being patriotic when their soldiers are sent thousands of miles away from the home country to kill any Arab or any other person that may be opposed to the lifestyle of America without even questioning how does that affect my life over here and has that anything to do with my life over here and my freedom here in the United States of America? How much freedom do I really have left? They don't ask these things anymore. And that is why the people in the government all over the world have it so easy for the moment now. Ignorance, that's all it comes to. And believe me, ignorance is not bliss. But back to you, Walt. Well, I think what you're trying to recap here is Second Peter 1.16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. What is the American Revolution? A fable. They made a fable <laughs> out of it. Yeah. It was not about tea and taxes. It was about religion. It was to give the Roman Catholic Church religious liberty and civil power. And so I can speak boldly in 2015. I've been belittled by several people. Walt, all you talk about is the Jesuits. Well, when they be, were belittling me and roasting me, we didn't have a Jesuit pope. And the pope wasn't coming over here. A Jesuit pope with an encyclical on climate change to give us a climate covenant. You see, that's why this phone call, I realized... I realized that's the strong delusion. The strong delusion that we see today is that people cannot see their adversary. It's right out there in front of us. I've been to Washington, D.C. on three different occasions. I've been to the top of that obelisk. I've seen all the statues. I didn't know when I when I was there a night when I went when I was 19 years old in 1964. It was three months after the assassination of President Kennedy. I didn't know what an obelisk was. I didn't realize that the street there was a pentagram printed right out in the streets of Washington D.C. But I do I did know that there was a Pentagon. But I didn't realize it was 40 acres, five stories high, and they started construction on 9-11 in 1941, three months before the war started. There's nothing that happens in politics that's an accident. And what we have been given, it's not so much what they're writing, it's what they're leaving out. And no, no, I agree with, with my brother and sister on Ellen G. White, and she wasn't a prophet. But the Seventh-day Adventists were one of the few who didn't forget their Reformation history. No, not to forget, Walt, well, the Seventh-day Adventists are controlled opposition. Yeah, that's right. 
and they're corporate. They're 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 set up corporately, just exactly. I'm not I, even I, talking about the 501c3 status that they have today. I'm talking about that they were founded by Freemasons. That's and right. as we have learned during our studies, we know that Freemasonry is just the Protestant arm of the Jesuits. But, but the, yeah? see the, you see, the point that I'm getting at is I listened for over 15 minutes. And finally, she said, well, are you still there? Yeah, I'm listening. I'm listening. And then when I mentioned that the Pope was coming, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. What is happening here? You know, my suggestion after I thought about it for a couple of days, I said, you know, you've been to eight weeks to a Seventh-day Adventist church. You need to go to your local Catholic church and sit in there for eight weeks and work the beads and look at the statues and, and see that it's nothing but an, a, a, a superstitious, idolatrous religion. That's all Roman Catholicism is. It's mystery Babylon. And, and it's, it's when you wake up to this, it's not an easy pill to swallow. It's going to take a couple glasses of water to get that pill down. And now, the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the carols. John, Daniel, and Charles. And we've been uh, reading from... Uh, from uh, <clears throat> the Grand Design Exposed, written by uh, John Daniel. So you say, well, you, we're getting a, pro a Protestant viewpoint. Everything, and I didn't, we didn't get a chance to get into the Ark of the Dove, but this is going to be kind of a, a recap. We're going to read an article that comes off the Catholic Educational Website. Matter of fact, you can find it by just doing Catholic Founding Fathers. It'll, it'll, it'll come up up in the, in, the, in the Google search. Now, the reason why I take people back to this article is now you say, well, Walt, you know, you're slanted. You know, you've got, you got an agenda. Yep, my agenda, my agenda is Jesus Christ. There's only one truth. And, and I'll say this right up front and recap it real quick. If you don't believe the first verse of the Bible, that God created the earth, he created the heavens and the earth, if we did a survey, how many people actually believe that? Well, I do. In my worldview comes from God's word. And I'm not interested in talking to anybody that doesn't believe in a six-day literal creation. And he rested on the seventh. That is how we begun. And the Big Bang Theory came from a Jesuit. Belgium. From Belgium. Peter Lemaitre. And that's the way Ken Hovind has spent 10 years in prison. I haven't heard the latest. I think he might be getting out. But I'd love to see him turn loose again. Because, you see, the key to their is, is evolution. Because once they, once they got, and they got every single university, when you go to a college, they're teaching you evolution. That is... I got uh, my good friend, you know, he, he, he got straight A's. He won't tell you that, but he got straight A's, so he was paying attention, and he has got a very good memory. That's why he got straight A's. But he, for four years, he had to gurgitate and swallow this, this garbage, this absolute trash. And why did they have Kent Hovind? Do you know that the judge that sentenced him to 10 years looked over the table at him and said, Mr. Mr. Hoven, you have committed a crime worse than rape. 
and Ken Hoven, they had a trans, they asked for the transcript. And guess what? That was out of the transcript. But listen, there was eight witnesses. Do you know why that lady told him? Do you know what the real reason why she looked at him and said, your crime is worse than rape? Because she knew what he did in the outside. She was, he was destroying her government religion. They all have the same religion. And the Roman Catholic Church, I can't think of this guy's name, the father of the New Age, but he was instrumental in getting this debate between evolution and creation started. Why? Because when you take and destroy God out of the culture of a, of a society, you can become their gods. And that is exactly what they've done. And anybody that has got, don't have as two neurons running, and we're being run by a world of these maniacs that preach evolution as a fact. And they're teaching our children today when the bus goes by and I see the kids get on the bus here. They're learning a religion. And they're learning the Roman Catholic universal religion. They're learning a superstitious and idolatrous religion. Now, let me tell you, I've been thinking them on this for three or four days. You say, well, Walt, what's this got to do with today's broadcast? Is because I was thrown in my face. They don't want to talk about Rome. And the reason that we're talking about Rome and the people that are in, on this call, they've had the, their, the scales taken off their eyes and their ears opened. And when I mention the Bible, they don't run like a bunch of cockroaches. That's the reason why. I'm not afraid of people not listening to this broadcast. I'm, a, I'm interested in the few that will. Because the few that will, I met, I met a brother here this last month. And I, he, he was kind of down and depressed. And I just, I just told him, I said, there's nothing wrong with your, with the way you're thinking. It's the world that's crazy. Because God tells us in the end times exactly what we see happening right now should be no surprise to us that have got our heads in the Bible. It shouldn't be any surprise. And when some of this history, this history, and this is the reason why we're going to cover this. We're going to we're going to we're going to cover this little. It's a small little article, but every bit of this is written from a Catholic point of view. They tell you their motive for the American Revolution in this. There's a very good reason for the American Revolution, and it's not about tea and taxes. So, so listen, I'm going to turn this back over to York. I appreciate you listening because uh, this has been heavy on my heart, especially I've been hammered, you know, and I'm criticized for my webpage, see? And all that's up on my webpage is a bunch of pieces of the puzzle. You can put the pieces together yourself. This Catholic Founding Fathers is up there. I, I have the first five chapters of the Ark and the Dove. I got P.D. Stewart's 31st chapter on the American Revolution. There's key pieces to the puzzle. And again, York is starting to read, he's starting to read Rulers of Evil. Here's a man that's living 
25 miles from the capital of the European Union the, in Brussels. How in the world does a man living in Europe know more history about America than a European? Because he accepts Jesus Christ and he realizes there's only one truth. There's only one truth and there's only one book that tells the behavior of these of these leaders that we that, and, and, and the Jesuits and Mystery Babylon, Daniel, Paul, John. It's part of our Bible. When 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 you when you when you hear somebody say, "Well, Walt, Walt, Walt listen, you talk about your adversary adversary too much. Your your enemy." The trouble is, the trouble is that the party that called me, they don't know their enemy. It's not the Seventh Day Adventists. It's not the Mormons. It's not the Jehovah Witnesses. It's Rome. And and all the reformers to the letter. This is what the Reformation did. It give us like you take a light bulb, you take a flashlight and you and you and you shine it. You've got a, a strong point in the middle. And then you get outer versions of the light. You see, the reformers give us the outer outer part of the light. The little bit of freedom that we have today, and it, it comes from the cross. But the center of that light, what the Reformation give us, was the God's word. That's the bulb. That's the light. And these reformers were just men coming out of the dark ages. People are, they, they forget. I, I, I hear people all the time. There's a website up there. The, guy, the guy's got one whole web page beating up Martin Luther. Yeah. But look at what they came out of. It was a dark, you know why they call it the dark ages? Because it was dark. You, 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 either, went to ch- you either went to church on the weekends and they took roll call, and if you, didn't, you weren't there, there was a knock on the door. You didn't question the priest. There was no freedom of conscience. Unheard of. But focus on the light. And it gets to uh, to this whole broadcast and the reading of rulers of evil is to take us back and to understand the real founding of America. The real founding of America. And who was really behind it? And how do we know today who benefited from the American Revolution? I'm going to tell you something. The Pope didn't come over here the first hundred years, or the first com- couple hundred years. I don't know when the first Pope it was in Carter's, uh, Carter. It was the first time the Pope came over here. But they own this country. They founded this country. Who do you think runs the Pentagon? The Puritans? The Mormons, the Seventh Day Adventists. Who do you think runs the CIA? Who do you think interprets the Constitution of the United States? Six out of nine chief justices are Catholic, and three Jews. There's not a Protestant in the bunch. And the Protestant Reformation is history. The people that are in here, we're reformers. 
And of course we, un- we understand our ad- adversary. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's so evident. And you know, the first time that I read Rulers of Evil, I was coming out of a, 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 a deep cloud. A deep cloud. I mean, I could some of the some of the things that Tupper Saucy was talking about. I I said, man, he's got a different viewpoint. But the more I you look, everything that Tupper Saucy, and if you want to refute his book, refute the first chapter. Subliminal Rome. If you can refute the first chapter, then put it away. You don't have to read it. But when Tupper Saucy wrote that book, it wasn't as bad as it is today. Even when Tupper Saucy wrote that book in 1992, every committee and subcommittee was chaired by a Roman Catholic. Every single everything. This this is a universal government, or you might say a Catholic government. It's a Catholic world. And so the reformers, they they were able to shine a little bit on the outskirts of it. But they didn't get the whole thing. The meat of it, the meat of it came from God's word. How many people, again, believe the first verse of the Bible in this country? You get church, you'll get church leaders that come out of these seminaries, seminarians, and Bible students that, that will argue that there was that the six days meant a thousand, every day was a thousand thousand years. They don't believe the Bible. Each day was the beginning and an end, a day and an evening. And guess what he God created in the first week? A week. Where do you think seven days comes from? The Roman the Roman calendar? A seven-day week comes from God's creation. God created the earth in six days, and he rested on the seventh. And then when you go to his commandment, the fourth commandment, there's the jurisdiction. Which God wrote those Ten Commandments? He tells you in the fourth commandment. The same God that created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. And people will sit here and argue with you. I don't care. Listen, this, 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 it's like this. The biblical Sabbath is, on, is, is the seventh day. And the seventh day Adventist didn't invent it. Seventh day Adventist didn't invent it. That seventh, that week, and people want to bring in the moon. And people say, well, you, you, all you do is repeat yourself. You re- can you count to seven? Can you, do you believe the first chapter of the Bible? Anyway, we're getting down. We've got one minute. And uh, you might just put a quick little close in here, uh, York, because we're down to, we're down to we got one more minute, so you want to close this uh, sec this uh, segment out because we're going to have a part two. Yeah, in the beginning you mentioned a book uh, written about exposing the cult, you know, and uh, just to go to that, I want to advise people to go to the website remnantofgod.org, www.remnantofgod.org, and then you go to RCC Exposed Catholic Doctrine and you have six signs of a cult and there you can see how the Roman Catholic Church fulfills every, every point of being a cult. I was just leaving our listeners with the idea of going to the website remnantofgod.org 
when they want to learn more about a cult. And uh, that was something that Walt started the broadcast of today with the book. Um, can you repeat that? Uh, what was that book called, Walt? The, King, the Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Mar Martin. The Kingdom of the Cults, yeah. And I guess that uh, that book speaks about every cult in the world except for the Roman Catholic Church. So when you go to remnantofgod.org <clears throat> and you follow the instructions that I just gave you, you go to... Um, uh, the RCC exposed section in the menu on the home page and then you scroll down to Catholic Doctrine and there you go down to Six Signs of a Cult you will read a very interesting document about how the Roman Catholic Church is exposed as the cult of all cults I give you a little example in sign 4 what is sign 4 of a cult each cult leader will teach a Jesus that is not found in the scriptures like Jim Jones or Charles Manson, their version of Jesus was light years from the true Jesus of the Bible. Do we see a different Jesus in the Roman Catholic Church as well? Do they really preach the Jesus of the Bible in Rome? Do they preach Jesus as Savior when their popes glorify Mary as co-Savior? Do they preach Jesus as the high priest when the Roman priests are drunks, smokers and sodomite child rapists? Do they preach Jesus peaceful while killing 500 million Christians during the Dark Ages that we we're also talking about? And this document goes on and on and on. I can really advise you to go to that site because that's a wonderful source of information there. And um, remnantofgod.org it's called, and we have been using that one also to identifying the Antichrist, that is our adversary. And we here on the broadcast, neither Walt nor I, we know who our adversary is. But we also know who our friend is. Our friend and our master and our Lord and our King is Jesus Christ. And our adversary is the dragon in the form of the Antichrist that sits on the throne in Rome pretending to be God. And according to Roman Catholic canon law, the Pope is Jesus Christ hidden under a veil of flesh. And this Roman Catholic Pope was very much involved in the founding of the United States of America. But you only know the founders, the so-called founding fathers, called no one father but he who is in heaven, I advise you. They only teach you these people like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, James Madison, and so on, and so on, and so on. And you never hear about the hidden founding fathers that are, on the one hand, exposed by uh, Tupper Saucy in his book, Rules of Evil, which I'm just doing a read on and that you can follow on my YouTube channel, Georgia 66. But they are also very much exposed in the Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy booklet that we are reading here. And I will now continue on reading page 93 of this document, dealing with the hidden founders of the American Revolution. Now, I would like to introduce you to the hidden founders of the American Revolution. Chris Pinto has made a documentary on the hidden faith of the founding fathers. That's, by the way, a very interesting two-and-a-half-hour documentary that you absolutely should watch. To understand why I call them the hidden founders, just ask yourself first, who are the Carrolls? Who are and what did Charles, Daniel, and John Carroll play in the American Revolution? Now, the article on Carroll's is right off a Catholic education website. To find the source link, just do a Google search on the title of the article, Catholic Founding Fathers, the Carroll Family. This article comes from Charles Carroll Carter. He is a direct ascendant of the Carroll family who we are dealing with here in the 18th century. Is there anything you want to say, Walt, before I go on, or shall I just continue reading now? I, I just continue. I, just, I, I think everybody understands. I just the main thing I want to make everybody understand that this is written by by a direct descendant of the Carroll Carter. So when you by by the Carrolls. So in other words, when we when we when we read this, we realize this is being read from a Catholic, Catholic viewpoint. That's Absolutely, that's the idea by mentioning Charles mm -hmm. Carroll Carter, who is a direct descendant of the yes. Carrolls from the 18th century. Right. So. George Washington, 
Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, James Madison, Patrick Henry, Benjamin Franklin. Nearly every schoolchild recognizes them as the founding fathers. But there were a great many more founding fathers, even if their names are not so familiar as the above. Several of those lesser-known men who played a key role in the creation of the United States of America were Catholics. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, James Madison, Patrick Henry, Benjamin Franklin. Nearly every school child recognizes them as founding fathers and signers of the Declaration of Independence, framers of the Constitution, heroes of the Revolutionary War. But, you know, this, this article is just uh, repeating itself, or what is that here? Um, yeah, several of those lesser known, yeah, yeah. Chief among them were three members of the Carroll family of Maryland. Charles Carroll, the only Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence, his cousin Daniel Carroll, and Daniel Carroll's brother John Carroll, who became America's first Catholic bishop. Charles Carroll of Carrollton lived between 1737 and 1832, so he became 95 years of age, was the most illustrious and best known of the Carrolls. He was the only signer whose property Carrollton was mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. Carrollton was the 10,000-acre estate in Frederick County, Maryland, that Charles Carroll's father had given him on his return to America from his education in Europe. And by the way, this education in Europe was for the most part in Flanders, in uh, the place where I live over here that is today called Belgium. I also live in Flanders. In the cities of Liège and the cities of Bruges, they were mostly Jesuit educated. At the time he signed the declaration, it was against the law for a Catholic to hold public office or to vote. Although Maryland was founded by and for Catholics in 1634, in 1649 and later in 1689, after the glorious revolution placed severe restrictions on Catholics in England, the laws were changed in Maryland and Catholicism was repressed. Comment? Comment? Yeah, please. Just to stop in, 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 in what, what they're telling you here, with, you know, although Maryland was founded by and for Catholics in 1634, in 1649, and later, in 1689, after the Glorious Revolution, the Glorious Revolution is swept out of history. This is part, it's not what they're writing, it's what they're leaving out. So uh, it's very important that you do your own research and understand the Glorious Revolution, that they replaced a king, with it had a revolution without a bullet being fired. And, and what they were trying to do, the Glorious Revolution, is, they tr is, is James II was trying to pass the Declaration of Indulgence, which would give England the same religious liberty that they, tr that they were successful in in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence. It caused a glorious revolution. The king left town. He went to France. And he was replaced by... Uh, <clears throat> um, I can't think of that king right now. Uh, but a, Protest a Protestant king and a queen. And a bullet wasn't fired. Why? Because the people in the streets knew that... And this was known in England that Rome... And because of the light of the Reformation, because of the light of the Reformation, they knew it was a superstitious, idolatrous religion. And on another broadcast, you know, that led to the royal declaration that the king and queen had to say. But it's this glorious revolution, if you just go over the top of it, but see, they know the person that writes this, this, they knew the significance of the glorious revolution. But the Protestants and the Americans in this, in this country don't know anything about the glorious revolution. Because, because the, 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 the American revelation, revolution turned all this around. It flip-flopped it. Now, now the superstitious, idolatrous religion was 
was legal. This is where we're at in history. And you, listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, this is not real exciting news. And if you don't have any faith, this is when your faith is tested. You have to, we have to have faith, and our liberty is in Jesus Christ, not the United States government. The United States government is Roman Catholic. So anyway, that's what I have to say about the glorious revolution, and I, I say to the listeners is do some, do some research on, on the glorious revolution. And you, there's, there's, lo, there's lots of articles up there, and you'll get the you, – see, so you have to put these pieces together. See, because, see, the reason I'm, I'm speaking like this, this is coming off of a, a Roman Catholic educational website, word for word. They know their history. And she, you see, any time, you know, Roman Catholicism is, is, is the minority, oh, they're real tolerant. See, they came over here and preached tolerance. You know, in other words, freedom of religion, you know, any religion, you can come to Maryland and you can, you can worship anything. You, you, can, you, can, you can, anything you want. I mean, we just, we just, we just want to get along to get along and we just want to love everybody and everything. When in Roman Catholic history has a Roman Catholic church ever believed in freedom of religion? That is why this is an important read. Because it's coming right from, but, but the, the, the dangerous part is, is this has been left out of, our, out of our history. And York mentioned earlier, to destroy a culture, all you've got to do is take their history away. But when you know this history, you know. When that nightly news comes on, and they just dropped a, a, a sortie of bombs on Baghdad, that wasn't a group of Puritans that did that. That wasn't a, that wasn't that wasn't a, 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 a you know a, a group of Christians practicing Bible ethics by carpet bagging Baghdad. You know, but anyway, you can continue with that that next paragraph. Okay, this is um, the last paragraph on page 94. I continue reading. Catholics could no longer hold office, exercise the franchise, educate their children in their faith, or worship in public. With the Declaration of Independence, all this bias and restriction ended. Charles Carroll I became known in colonial politics through his defense of freedom of conscience and his belief that the power to govern derived from the consent of the governed. He was a staunch supporter of Washington, and when the war was going badly at Valley Forge, he was instrumental in persuading the Revolutionist Board of War not to replace Washington with General Horatio Gates. Carroll supported the war with his own private funds. He was widely regarded as the wealthiest of all the colonists, with the most to lose, were the fight for independence to fail. Carroll was greatly acclaimed in later life, and he outlived all the other signers of the Declaration. Daniel Carroll of Rock Creek, between 1730 and 1796, was a member of the Continental Congress between 1781 and 1783, and the signer of the Articles of Confederation. He was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, and one of the only two Catholic signers of the United States Constitution. The other Catholic signer, by the way, was Thomas Fitzsimmons of Pennsylvania. At the Constitutional Convention, Dan Daniel Carroll played an essential role in formulating the in uh, limitation of the powers of the federal government. He was the author of the presumption enshrined in the Constitution that powers not specifically delegated to the federal government were reserved to the states or to the people. Daniel Carroll later became a member of the first United States Congress between 1789 and 1791. Comment. I, I, I just wanted to make one little quick comment up, uh, up on page 94 when Charles Carroll mentions freedom of conscience. He said, you know, when they mentioned freedom of charge, 
He says, Charles Carroll first became known in colonial politics through his defense of freedom of conscience and his belief that the power to govern derived from the consent of the government. That is Jesuit casuistry and sophistry. Rome's never believed in freedom of conscience. Millions of people have went, went to their death. When you go in, and by, that, and by the way, when you go into, a, when you go into a, a Protestant evangelical church today or any church in, in this country, you don't have freedom of conscience. People don't even know what freedom of conscience is. You're not, when you go into a Roman Catholic church, you're there to work the beads, eat the cookie, pay the man, and leave. And it's no different in, than, than in the Mormon church. You're not there to, to try to reform the Mormon church. You're there to pay and pray. And it's no different than any of all these, because, because they, that's the way, it's freedom of conscience. You see, we, we have to, when I, when I listen to somebody and I disagree with somebody, well, that, that's their freedom of conscience. I don't hit them over a head, hit them over a head and lock them up and torture them. That's what the Roman Catholic Church has done through history. And it's, and it's, no, it's, it's, no, it's no different in, in our time, World War I and World War II, was just another inquisition and they labeled, labeled it war. There was no freedom of conscience in the Third Reich. I mean, and the Americans today, we have become spoiled. I get a little upset, even at myself, and I look back in my history. We've been spoiled. We've been spoiled. How did they destroy us? They give us all we wanted and then took our history away. Give us football games, basketball games, and entertainment, and, and, Holly, and Holly Weird. That's, that's how they overcome us. They kept us busy. And, they took, what, and what, what happened? They took the Bible away. So, you know, uh, I, I just want to overemphasize that for what freedom of conscience and Charles Carroll is no one to, I mean, Charles Carroll is not an advocate of freedom of conscience. That, this article, you understand, is written with a Catholic viewpoint. It's written using casuistry and sophistry and mental reservation. Now you, you say, well, what is mental reservation? Look, up, look it up. You'll, you find it in the Catholic encyclopedia, okay? It's not in the dictionary. But what it is, it's like if I was looking at you and shaking your hand and looking right square in your eyeball and lying to you. That's mental reservation. And the Roman Catholic Church has worked that to a worked that for centuries. So it is important that we, when we read this article, that you understand who our adversary is who our enemy, our true enemy is. He's very subtle. And it sounds good. It sounds good. But what is the history of the Roman Catholic Church? These men that they're talking about, Charles, Daniel, and John, all three of them are Jesuits. One of them only gets credit. One of, one of them only gets credit for for it, uh, uh, and that's you know John John Carroll was a Jesuit 26 years. He got 26 years of education, but the other two had 12 to 14 years. So so anyway, continue with the article. Daniel Carroll later became a member of the first United States Congress between 1789 and 1791. He was also a member of the First Senate of Maryland, where he served up to the time of his death. Okay. 
Oh, we have a little technical problem here, Walt. Can you still hear me? I can still hear you. I think. Go ahead. Go oh. ahead. So, okay. I, 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 just, I, I just muted somebody in the lot. In the uh, had a guest from North Virginia, and I just muted them. The reason I, I mute their, their mics is is so if somebody coughs or the phone rings or something happens, you know. So anyway, uh, that's what that's what I did. Just go ahead. Okay, threw me off a little bit. Yeah. So I'm gonna start again. Yeah, Daniel. Car- um, no, the, that's where I was. Um, he was appointed by Washington as one of the first three commissioners of the new federal city that is now known as the District of Columbia. In today's terminology, we would have been considered the mayor of Washington, D.C. John Carroll, between 1735 and 1815, Daniel Carroll's younger brother, was educated in Europe, joined the Jesuit order, and was ordained a priest. He founded a private school for boys and named it after the town where it was located. Georgetown, a port on the Potomac River, and remember the Potomac River actually is the River Tiber, as mentioned in Rulers of Evil, that later became part of Washington, D.C. He went on to be elected by all the Catholic priests in America to become America's first Catholic bishop. He later became Archbishop of Baltimore. In any procession of American bishops, the Archbishop of Baltimore always goes last, in recognition of its, role of, of its role as America's oldest diocese. In 1789, John Carroll founded the college in Georgetown that later became known as Georgetown University. Comment. Now, yeah, you want to make a comment, I want to make a comment too, because you, you Georgetown, Uni- you, Georgetown University is the lawgiver, the legislative power in the United States of America. Jesuit founded, Jesuit run, all the time, since more than 200 years already. And uh, I was already a long time doing a video on Georgetown uh, University because I have found a very nice video on uh, YouTube where you can see a lot of interesting people like Hillary Clinton, John Kerry, and uh, other people going into Georgetown University and doing speeches. And for example, very interesting to know is that also Ron Paul spoke at Georgetown University. And did you know that Ron Paul was more than 13 times in his lifetime over in Rome? I guess he would never tell that while he was running for president, right? Georgetown University is Jesuit to the core. And the seal of Georgetown University and the great seal of the United States have been invented simultaneously and put these two next to each other and compare them and you will see where they are the same but okay Walt you wanted to add something here well I think you filled in everything that I wanted to say in oh, especially, sorry. <laughs> especially especially the seal the seal was in 1789 and the great seal if you look if you put them side by side there you know it's it said it's going to comment on this article a little bit later that uh, George Washington give a uh, give it give the seal uh, to uh, Georgetown University, but it mean if the truth was to be known, who give it to who? I mean Georgetown University give it to, to George Washington. You know, I mean it, it's it's all the same. And another thing too, another thing too, is if that seal that seal with the all C and I on the on the, the great seal. Everybody think that that's Masonic. That's Masonic. Well, it is. I mean, it's in Masonic circles. Okay. But it's, it's in, that all C&I is in cathedrals all over Europe, all over the world. I did, I, 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 somebody sent me a, a link one day, and I was going to do a web page on it. But uh, that all C&I is not just Masonic. You see, the Masons and the Jesuits at the top are the same. They rule the same. They're Luciferian. I mean, they're, they're, they're Satan worshippers, you know. But uh, that's you know. But anyway, this this continue. That's what I wanted to say about 1789. Okay. During a period when the Revolutionary War was going badly, Washington asked John Carroll to join a mission to Canada to seek the support of the French for the colonies. Benjamin Franklin, Samuel Chase, and Charles Carroll of Carrollton were in the others on the four-man missions. While it failed, it established a relationship with the French, 
much influenced by the Catholic faith uh, they held in common with the Carols. It bore fruit years later at Yorktown, where the largely Catholic-financed French fleet cut off supplies to British General Charles Cornwallis, and Washington was able to force Cornwallis to surrender and bring the war to an end. John Carroll was an intimate of Washington. He wrote a prayer at the time of Washington's inauguration asking God's blessing on the president. Congress and government of the United States, a prayer still very much in use today. Out of gratitude for John Carroll's support during the war, Washington gave a modified version of the seal of the United States to the institution that is now Georgetown University. And that seal is still in use. Well, that's what we Com just Com established a little bit earlier here. Comment. Comment, all right. Well, let me just finish the last paragraph, okay. Walt, and then you can comment all you want because we are not going to read any more of this book today, I think, but we will still go on discussing the points that we have been discussing so far. Okay. Despite their enormous contributions to the American founding, the three carols somehow fell below the radar screen of recognition as full-fledged founding fathers. Perhaps that was because they were Catholics, 1%, in a country and a culture that for many years was overwhelming, for 99%, Protestant. This um, ends the reading of this carol part of this book. And this last paragraph is very interesting that you can see how in a few years' time, when you see history as a very long time frame, of course, it's quite in a few years' time how 1% of Catholics in a country of 99% Protestant turned that over. And another example for that is Poland, where they did the same thing. And Walt and I went there when we were on the broadcast on the Jesuits derooting the Reformation. You can check that out in the archives and listen to that. And they did in Poland exactly the same thing that they did in the United States of America. Turn a Protestant country over to Catholic. And how did they do that? By taking over the education system. That brings us back to where we started this broadcast. Okay, Walt, looking forward to your comment now. Well, I, I, want, to, I want to comment. <clears throat> Despite their enormous contributions to the American founding, the three carols somehow fell below the radar screen of the recognition as a full-fledged founding fathers. Now, this is being written by a Catholic historian or, or a dis direct descendant of the Carrolltons. You, you know, this statement that stunned me for four or five months, it was about five months that I didn't do any broadcasts, because I said, I had a little voice in me or something that was saying, well, you know, it's really not necessary that people know the carols. Well, and one thing, and then when you wrote, perhaps that was because there were Catholics in a country, in a culture that for many years was overwhelmingly Protestant. Now, I put the 1% and the 99% in there. I want to be really, really up front with, the, you know, the, that was not in the original. But you see, but the statement is, is, is the statement is correct. Perhaps that was because the, they were Catholics in a country and a culture that were for many years was overwhelmingly Protestant. Now that is a correct statement. You know, and I, I, I want to just say this too. You know, you might say, well, well you know, you really got a, a thing against the United States. You're not, you're not a very good American. No, no. You see, the Constitution, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, it'd be great if they were going by them. But they, from the time of the inception of the United States, understand, they fom fomented the American Revolution. The Jesuits, but they had to give us more than they wanted to give us. You know, just, just a second, I've got some noise here. Is that you, Northern Virginia? I've got, I've got a, I wonder when I mute this, I don't dialed in, unmuted. Uh, I, anyway, I'm getting some noise there. Okay. I don't, I don't know if I mute them, but if I, if I, if I shut them off, I don't know. But anyway, listen, this is a very important. This last sentence is very important to stop and put this in its right perspective. You see, 
because there's nothing wrong with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Because you can look at our history, and we don't have a good history record. I mean, there's been violence. We had a civil war less than 100 years old, killed 700,000 people, killed more. More people were killed in the Civil War than all the wars combined. Now, when I first heard that statement, I thought maybe there are, there are you know, because we've had a lot of wars. But see, we only lost 400,000 people. I, I shouldn't say that like only 400,000 in World War II when there were 60 million people killed. See? But if you look at the history of the United States... The struggle, the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights has been under attack from the very get-go. And who has been the attacker? Who is our adversary? It's Rome. I love this country. The freedom that I, 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 I I'm a, 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 I was born in 1944. I'm a baby boomer. I guess what they call him, you know. You know, in other words, and I listen, I've had some good years. But I've watched this country dismantle piece by piece. I mean, for somebody to be in a small business today, the small businesses are under attack. We don't make anything. But it's no we don't make anything. Everything is shipped overseas. We assemble a 747 up here in Everett, Washington. But the assemblies, it's just assembled there. And I've watched, I've watched this country taken apart piece by piece. And then we had 9-11. And look, within two weeks they passed the, the Patriot Act. This is all by design. And 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 the the, the thing the thing that 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 what what can, what what is what is the answer? The answer is your faith in Jesus Christ. We're not going to straighten this out. We're the enemies. How many how long do you think that websites like this and we'd be able to discuss some real history. We've been giving you when we started on this on this Vatican Jesuit global conspiracy, we're giving you some real history. We're talking about real history. This these men, John Carroll and Charles and Daniel, they they were they were real. John Carroll founded Jesuit Georgetown University. The foreign policy, the war, World War II was run from Georgetown University. The, the School of Foreign Affairs created by Edmund Walsh. Edmund Walsh is real. Edmund Walsh was over in, in Russia in in, in, in when they when they when they fired that revolution off, he 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 was he handled MacArthur in Japan. He was over at the Nuremberg trials, and he was he was he was the one that was behind the Rhine Rhine Meadow death camps of Eisenhower. How many people have heard about the death camps of Eisenhower? I'm going to tell you something. There's a video out there, and I shared it with a few people. It's the only video that I've ever watched that I've almost had to shut off. Why? Because I am an American. And what, what happened to what, what the president of the United States and the Jesuit, what Edmund Walsh, it was Edmund Walsh who was handling Eisenhower. How do I know that? Because when Edmund Walsh died, I've even got a website up there 
the speech that Eisenhower went, he went over to Georgetown University and he 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 lauded he 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 lauded, what's the word I want to use he 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 praised the Jesuits and Edmund Walsh. Who do you, who do you think's behind communism? Communism in the Cold War is a boogeyman. Who do you think's behind ISIS? Who do you think's behind the Islam? Islam. Who do you think's behind immigration in this country? It's not the Puritans. It's not the Mormons. It's not the Seventh Day Adventists. And you know, it's not the innocent Catholic people on the street. There's a lot of ignorant people, and it doesn't matter whether they're. they're but one thing they all have in common, they're going into a building. They're checking their brains, and their Bible at the door. And they're giving up their freedom of conscience, stepping into the building, and getting brain brain dead by bombardment. Mystery Babylon, through history, has always used religion to control people. And you know the thing that I'm that, that I what is what is what is the agenda here? Is to put the word Jesuit in your vocabulary, to put the word John Carroll in your historic understanding of history, to put the Roman Catholic element in the American Revolution. To, to continually ignore that, if you go back to my first, the first broadcast, you know, people, people will, you know, they'll call you up and just pepper the Seventh-day Adventists. That pepper the Seventh-day Adventists. And when I mentioned, mentioned the visit by the Pope, I don't want to go there. Listen, I took it. I didn't get angry. I realize that they're they're deceived. I've been there. How could I get mad? I was I didn't I didn't understand anything about Roman history prior to about six years ago. When I was out in the truck, I did read Mar Fox's Book of Martyrs. I did read that. And I had a little bit of understanding, but but I didn't have any of this history. And I'm so thankful for God that God is, we've been blessed. People on this call, we've been blessed. If you've hung on this call for an hour, that tells me that, you're, that you, you realize you've been lied to. How did they lie to us? What are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? Am I telling you, am I advocating that you grab an AK-47 and store up 10 years of food and attack the... the, the, the the United States government? No. No. This is post Protestantism. This is this is they've taken over. You need to grab your book, the book, the Bible, and read. There's not another book that explains exactly what's going on. That's what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in the 90% of the people in this country that don't believe the first verse of the Bible. I'm interested in the ones that have their ears to hear. I'm interested in fellowship. And I just got to thank my brother, York. York. And I'm telling you, I, I'm going to finish here and give it back to you. But listen, he's reading... Tupper Saucy's book, Rulers of Evil. And I've only heard four chapters, but he's a good reader. God has blessed him. He might be sitting right in the middle of the European Union, 25 miles from the capital, Brussels. But God has given him an ear to hear and eyes to see and a voice to voice his, voice his freedom of conscience. That's what I got to say, York. Okay. Thank you, Walt. 
I just want to go back a little bit to Georgetown University because you mentioned that and I read, uh, I read this here in this article that in 1789 John Carroll founded the college in Georgetown that later became known as Georgetown University and you were just talking about the Patriot Act and how it was uh, put into law just a few months after the attacks of 9-11. Many of our listeners maybe are not aware of this, but the Patriot Act came right out of Georgetown University, written by a person called Viet Dinh, a Vietnamese refugee from the before then leading family of Vietnam, coming over in a small boat with his mother, landed on the western coast of the United States and became, uh, what was it, uh, banana farmer or something, picked bananas or I don't, I don't know, some fruit. Anyway, and he went on to Georgetown University and uh, I'm quite sure it is certain that he is a Catholic. I'm quite sure even that he's a Jesuit. And he wrote the Patriot Act. Now, do you, any anybody of you any know what Patriot Act stands for. It stands for providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism act of 2001. I'm going to read it again, the full title of the Patriot Act, uniting and strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism act of 2001. That's the official explanation that you get when you go to Wikipedia. And this has nothing to do with patriotism, does it? It's just fitting that appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism act match together as patriot. Very, very well formulated these words so that they come together as the word patriot. And with that, you get every American. Because, A, you want to be patriotic, right? You want to love your country, right? Not understanding that your country lies in the kingdom of the Antichrist and that your real patriotism should be lying in the kingdom of Christ. And that is the one you should seek. Not the Antichrist, but Christ. And his patriotism for his kingdom that we are all serving down here. And this is why we are doing this broadcast. But be not betrayed. The Patriot Act has absolutely nothing to do with patriotism. It's as patriotic as the Federal Reserve is federal. Think about that. And for the rest, I just want to say, only a fool trusts his soul to a preacher or his health to a doctor, his rights even to a lawyer or choices to a politician. A fool trusts his money to a banker or information from a news channel, or even history from a school system, education from a university, or security from a police force, or freedom from a government. The only one who can give you freedom is Jesus Christ, and the truth of his words that he spoke when he was on this earth, and came here and died for our sins, to redeem us so that we can be shareholders in the kingdom of Christ forever and ever. Amen. By this, I want to close the broadcast for today. I thank you very much for listening and watching the video. And Walt, thank you very much for your contribution. And uh, next week, we will continue reading the booklets, The Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy. And until then, I wish you a nice day, a nice week. Thank you for listening, and God bless you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye for now.